So today we're in James. We're in chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 13 through 18 as we continue our new series in this very powerful, instructive book. So let me begin reading at verse 13 in James chapter 1. I'll read to verse 15 and we'll get into our study. James chapter 1, beginning at verse 13, reading to verse 15. And I might want to begin by saying I will be going back to verse 12 to develop that a bit further for you, for I did not give to you all that I wanted to give you last time we were together. You'll see that in just a moment. But beginning at verse 13, reading to verse 15, James writes, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. And so as we're looking at this passage, as mentioned a moment before, I want to draw your attention back to verse 12 for a moment and lay a foundation. And then I'm going to move into verse 13 and take us all the way to verse 18 today. But by looking at verse 12 as our foundation, our introduction, notice how James said, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And so James just said that the one who endures temptation receives a reward, and he said they receive the crown, the crown of life. Now, when James uses the word crown, that word crown in the original language Greek is the word Stephanus. And that literally speaks of a badge of royalty. The crown was a prize given in athletic contests. It was used as a symbol of honor. In ancient Greek games, it was, uh, uh, it was a garland of leaves that was placed on a victor's head as a reward for winning a contest. In the New Testament, it is a symbol of the rewards of heaven that God promises faithful believers. Now, the rewards that God grants to faithful believers are rewards that are given out at what is called the Bema Seat of Christ, the Bema Seat of Christ. It's also referred to as the Judgment Seat of Christ. Romans chapter 14, verses 10 through 12 says, Why do you judge your brother, or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the Judgment Seat, the Bema Seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us shall give account of himself to God. That takes place at the Bema Seat. Someone wrote that the concept of the Bema Seat comes from the ancient Greek Olympics, where a judge would sit on the Bema Seat at the finish line. The judge's purpose was to determine what position runners finish a race, first, second, and so on, and then to give out the appropriate rewards. Paul was picturing the believer as a competitor in a spiritual contest. As the victorious Grecian athlete appeared before the Bema to receive his perishable award, so the Christian will appear before Christ's Bema to receive his imperishable award. So the judgment seat is not a place that determines salvation. That takes place at what is called Actually, uh, the judgment that comes for punishment for sin is called the white throne judgment. But the judgment seat of Christ doesn't determine salvation because salvation was determined by Christ's sacrifice on our behalf and our faith in him. When you got saved, all of your sins were forgiven, every single one of them. Not a single one of your sins remains. It's all washed, it's all cleansed, it's all forgiven, and you're not condemned for them. So the judgment seat of Christ is not God judging our sins. Believers don't stand in, in this kind of judgment because we've been completely forgiven. But unbelievers will stand before God in judgment, as mentioned a moment ago, at the white throne. That's in Revelation chapter 20. But believers will stand before the Bema seat to receive rewards for faithful service. Now, Paul made that clear when he was writing to the Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, for example, he said... We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. 
when he wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, he said, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. So appearing before the judgment seat provokes us to sincere service. You see, we're saved by grace, but that doesn't remove the responsibility of living right before God. So our daily walk, the way you live every day, reveals your new life. It reveals the fact that you have a new nature. And so we appear. We appear before the judgment seat to receive rewards, but not for judgment concerning our sins. In Ephesians 6, verse 8, Paul said, You know the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does. So our sins, again, have been wiped clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. So it's at the Bema seat that we receive our rewards, and they are referred to as crowns. And in the New Testament, you have five different crowns. In verse 12, you have what he refers to as the crown of life. We'll look at that in just a moment. But the New Testament speaks of other crowns. For example, you have the imperishable crown. Now, that's mentioned in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 25. Paul said, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath but we an imperishable. So the crown, this crown reflects the fact that material crowns wither, they become brittle, they perish, but the imperishable crown represents an inheritance that does not perish. In 1 Peter 5.4 it says, this is an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, that is reserved or kept in heaven for you. So you have the imperishable crown. You also have the crown of rejoicing, that's the second crown. In 1 Thessalonians 2.19, Paul said, what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? So we rejoice in the blessings that God has showered on us. We have most to be joyful about on earth, and in heaven, there is overwhelming joy. When we got saved, God took uh, the ashes, and he replaces it with beauty, and God has given to us so much that there's nothing but the opportunity to understand the joy that he has. We have a crown of rejoicing because God has blessed us. He's showered his blessings on us. And we should be the most joyful on the face of the earth. I remember when I first was a, a young believer and a young teacher, I, I discovered Psalm 16, verse 11, which said, you will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And that spoke to me because God does these things and this is what I have in him. In Revelation 21, 4, it says, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. We have the crown of rejoicing. God has given to us. We, we, we rejoice in the Lord always. Again, like Paul said, I say rejoice. We, the crown, we have the crown of righteousness. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 8, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Well, Jesus is righteous. We have what is called imputed righteousness. He, he gives to us that which we don't have. He imputes to us that which we don't have in our own strength. It's a called an imputed righteousness. We have faith in Christ, and he gives us that which is his, something we don't have of our own. And so as we await his return, we endure. We endure discouragement. We go through persecution, suffering. There are those who have gone through martyrdom. But we do so knowing our reward is with Jesus in heaven. Philippians 3.20 says our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We also have what is called the crown of glory. In 1 Peter 5, verse 4, the apostle writes, When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. When he speaks of the crown of glory, glory speaks of God's nature and God's actions. 
his splendor, his brightness. We're going to give to God all the praise and all the glory that is rightfully his, that belongs to him. And in doing so, we realize that he has blessed us in bringing us to heaven. In Hebrews 2.10, it says, It was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. And we have the crown of life. The crown of life is for believers who persevere in their faith, even under that persecution. Church history abounds with the stories of believers who remain faithful in cases of persecution and trial, and the Bible promises them a special reward. And believers know that Jesus is the bread of life, and we know that Jesus is the living water. And this crown reveals that we've received life through him and we live for him. And we received this crown because we've remained faithful to him. To the end, we've loved God, revealed our love by keeping his commandments. There are people who say, oh, I love the Lord, but don't even have a desire to keep his commandments. But Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you really love me, you desire to do that which I have told you. They're not burdensome like 1 John tells us in chapter 5, verse 3. He said, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. His commandments are not burdensome. They're not grievous. They're not things like, oh, what a bummer. I can't get drunk anymore. Oh, man, he's just ruining my life because I can't sleep around anymore. It's not a bummer. I can't steal anymore. You know, no, they're not burdensome. Why? Because... His commandments bring life because his, his commandments are the joy of our heart. It's because we want to serve him. That reveals that you have a new nature. If you have a nature that rebels against the things of God, that's not the new nature. That's the old nature. What God wants to do is work in us and to realize that when he says, don't do this or do this, that it's not a burden to us. It's a joy of our heart because we're in the center of his will and he blesses us. It's what should provoke a believer to hold fast, especially when we're being tempted. And that's basically what we're speaking of as we look at this, because in verse 12, when he says, blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he'll receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. He goes on in verse 13 to say, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Sometimes it may be difficult to determine if you're being tested or tempted. God doesn't tempt you with evil. He doesn't move you into a direction that will lead to you in obeying that direction, entering into sin. Hey, you might have been an alcoholic, loved your drink. You got saved, and suddenly you start saying to yourself, I feel a call by God to go into bars. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think so. You know, I, I, I used to do a lot of drugs, and I have my friends in the old neighborhood and I used to purchase, and I'm just going to go in. Well, and then you fail, and you say, well, God led me in there. God told me to go there. No, James is saying, no, let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. God, God doesn't tempt you with evil. Neither does he himself tempt any man. No, God is not tempting you. He's not saying, go and do this. You see, people will say, well, I gave in to temptation and God made me sin. Well, let's look at that for a moment. There is a difference between God's testings and Satan's temptations. There's a difference between God's testings and Satan's temptations. God's testings are desired, designed to reveal the quality of your faith. The, the testings are intended to develop strength. God's testings are used to refine your faith and to produce purity and holiness in your life. Like the psalmist said in Psalm 66, verse 10, you, O God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. God's testings are not intended to cause failure. God's testings encourage victory. God's testings draw you closer to him, and they teach you the value of obey, obeying him. Psalm 119, verse 67 says it like this, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. So when the Lord brings a testing in your life, it's to refine you. It's to, it's to reveal the quality of your faith that you have. It's not intended for you to fail. 
So let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. God doesn't tempt anyone with evil. Satan's temptations are intended to destroy. He tempts to instigate us to sin, not to succeed. And you see it from the very beginning. You see it when Satan tempted Eve to disobey God. Eat of this fruit, he said to her. And she saw that it was beautiful to look at. It was going to make her wise and all. And, 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 and she took of it, and, she, and, and in doing so, she resisted the command of God and entered into the temptation of the enemy. It's, it's, it's true in Scripture that Satan intends to lead you astray. In 2 Corinthians 11, 3, Paul said, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. The book of Job is centered on Satan's attempts to, to tempt Job to curse God. That the whole book shows that in the first two chapters. He says it, you know, God says, have you considered my servant Job? He's an upright man, a righteous man. There's none like him on the face of the earth. And, and Satan immediately responds, I say, well, you put a hedge around him. Take all that he owns, and then later on, take, take, touch his skin, and he'll curse you to your face. His intent, Satan, as we know in Scripture, was in, his intent was to destroy Job and to make God look in, that he had no power to keep those whom he loved. Satan even tempted Jesus to sin, as is recorded in the three, three of the four Gospels. The Gospels reveal how, how Jesus resisted and how he overcame, and it gives to us insight how we can too. In Luke chapter 4, verses 5 through 8, the Bible says the devil led Jesus, led him up to a high uh, place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I, I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So he shows us how to overcome. Jesus shows us it is written. It is written three times. It is written. The word of God empowers you, gives you wisdom, strength, the power of the Spirit gives you the ability, and you resist. Well, Jesus became man, and he lived as a perfect example to us, and that helps us in our time of need. Hebrews 2.18 says, He himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. And so in verse 13, God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Evil is not enticing to God. There's nothing evil that God wants. Habakkuk, in the Old Testament, Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13, says to God, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. There's nothing in evil that God wants. So when someone says, I am tempted by God, God himself, God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. There's nothing in evil, James is saying, that is tempting to an almighty, holy God. Satan tempts. He tempted Jesus unsuccessfully because there's nothing within God that desires what Satan offers. In John 14, verse 30, Jesus said, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. There is nothing he can offer me that can cause something within me to respond to and desire. He has nothing in me. So how does this happen then? Well, verse 14 says, each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Temptation originates in our hearts. In Proverbs 19, verse 3, a man's own folly ruins his life, yet his heart rages against the Lord. Each is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. There's something inside of us that will respond to the enticement. Let's see if I can try and make this clearer through an illustration, seduction. Because the Bible speaks concerning seduction. 
were drawn away and enticed. There's something within me that responds. I was sharing with uh, women at, at the women's uh, retreat a while back now how that, how men are. So I'll, kinda, I'll talk about us men for a while because it's true. Um, men are, and of course I'll speak in general terms, but by and large men are like hunters. And seduction is one of the ways that we victimize people. So a guy sees something about a girl that he likes, and he begins to be drawn to her. And so as a hunter, he begins to discover ways that he can entrap her and ensnare her. And all you have to do is speak to her for a little while. She's single or whatever. She's vulnerable. And you discover that fairly quickly. You can do that. And you hear her say certain things, and before you know it, you start cataloging the things that she's saying. And you start finding things about her that you know are points of weakness. At least you see them as vulnerabilities. You see them as possibilities or places of access. And so she seems to be concerned a little about her weight because she says it every once in a while. Now she feels, oh, this doesn't fit. And so the guy, the hunter, begins to think, hmm, how can I... How can I take advantage of her? So what does he do? He says, have you dropped some weight lately? And she wants to hear that. She wants to hear that. Oh, no, actually, oh, no. You know, gained a little. Well, you could, you fools me. You look so good. And she thinks that's sincere. No, that's just page one. He's just starting. And he hears other things, other insecurities, other things. She, and he begins to realize she'd like to hear certain things. She does her hair a little bit different. He's already seen that she's concerned about the way she looks, so he walks up and says, I'm sorry, don't want to be too personal, but did you do something with your hair? It just, I don't know, it makes you look, I don't want to insult you, forgive me. You look younger. Oh, boy, he got, th those are two. <laughs> your hair's nice and you look younger, you've lost weight, and what he's doing, and you don't even know it. I'm not saying every man's this way. Just 99.999999% of us. And we find what it is you want to hear, and we will say it. We're hunters. We're hunters. And we're going to seduce you. We're going to find a way to do that. And how did I do that, and how do I do that? By finding what you want to hear and promising you that it's possible for you to have it. By finding that thing that you want and making you think, I'm the one who can get it for you. That's how it works. It's seduction. And guess what the enemy does? It's the same kind of thing. It's interesting, on, in various times when you're reading your Bible, you'll see the word seduce or seduction, or you'll see the word deceive. And very often, the word deceive and the word seduce are the same Greek word, just translated by different English words. Because the root of seduction is deception. The way that somebody deceives and seduces is similar. And so the enemy gives you promises that he can't keep, but you want to hear. And so I'm trying to serve the Lord. And God has put me in these places where I'm being hurt. I'm being tempted of God. And James says, no, let no one say that. When he is tempted, he is tempted of God. God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither does he himself tempt anyone. Don't begin, begin to believe that God brought you to a place to let you fall. Don't believe that God took you here so you'd fail, so he might bring judgment in your life. The enemy's doing that. The enemy is attempting to destroy you. And that's what James is telling us about. And when you look at verse 15, notice there's a progression. When you see verse 14, it says, each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desire and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. There's a progression. There's the drawing away, the enticing, the conceiving, the birth. The fact that it grows and then it dies. Again, it's a picture of seduction. It's the seduction of a person's will. 
It's a seduction that makes them captive to sin. And when the will is seduced, it becomes pregnant and it brings forth sin. Our sin nature is responsive to sin's deception. In Hebrews 3.13, the writer said, Exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin deceives you. It lies to you. It says, if you do this, you'll be happy. I was sharing this recently, the first service, and I was, I was saying to them, and it's an old illustration, but I, 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 when I see commercials, especially when I'm watching a sports program, the commercials seem to always be one of two things. And normally, there's a lot of alcohol involved. Normally, there's a lot of alcohol involved. You know, you watch this, and either it's crazy chicken, al pollo loco, or it's beer. And you see that in the game. And that's true in a lot of the games. A lot of beer commercials. And I've said this before, but it's true. All you have to do is have eyes to see, and you see it. How come at every bar, every bar has real handsome, you know, these commercials, they're, they're real handsome young men with, with you know, 30-inch waists, you know, huge shoulders. They're all swoopy pretty, you know. And the women are walking around like they're going to the prom. I mean, it's just odd. You know, they're all beautiful people, right? And they're just down in this beer. And they say, oh, wait, wait a minute. This is health food because this is light beer. It has less calories. <laughs> they never show you, they never show you what somebody who goes to the beer for a lifetime, goes to a bar for a lifetime for their beers, they never show you what that guy really looks like. A T-shirt that doesn't cover his belly. Yeah. One tooth because he's had the other teeth broken out in bar fights. They never show you that. They're not handsome, cool, suave people, beautiful women in nice dresses. Those are commercials. But the commercials are always making you think that that's what cool people do, right? That's what cool people do. There's always this deception that if you do this, if you buy this, you're going to be happy. There's always pleasure but never any pain. The promise is always pleasure, never any pain. They will not tell you that you go to that bar, you get drunk, you hook up with that good-looking person, and six weeks later, you realize you're pregnant. They never talk about those things. You don't even know the name of that person. I remember a, a, a man who picked up a woman at a bar, took her home, spent the night with her. She got up early and left. He didn't know her name, knew nothing about her. It was one of those one-night stands and all. He went to his bathroom in the morning to, to clean up and get ready for his day. And she, with her lipstick, had written on his mirror, Welcome to the world of AIDS. Those things happen. Anybody ever tell you that? You ever see that in a commercial? The girl who had that relationship in that movie? The movies, isn't it always cool? It's always cool. Well, she sleeps with 15 different guys, but finally finds Prince Charming. Isn't that real life? That's really how it is, right? That's how it really is. And she's had multiple abortions. One after another and begins to spiral down further and further. But wait a minute. The enemy said that you're going to have a good time if you do this. The enemy said you're going to be happy. You're going to be popular. He told you that. He whispered. He said that. You needed it. And guess what? You end up dead. Sin always ends up in death. Always. It doesn't lead you to life. It leads you to death. And that's what James is saying. He's saying that something entices you, and eventually your brain gives birth to, if you will, the desire for, and you get involved in sin, and it ends up with death. That's what he's warning us about. Do, do not be deceived. The final result of sin is death in all its forms, both now and eternally. Sin naturally and regularly produces death. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So he says in verse 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Do not begin to think that God is the author of sin or is tempting you to sin. The inclination to sin originates in your heart. You see, when we're saved, we can have victory over sin. We can produce fruit that glorifies God. Our lives change. We no longer practice sin as a way of life. It's no longer the habit. In 1 John 3, verse 6, John said it like this, no one 
who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. When you're saved, you begin to walk worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you're saved, you can say, I once was, but I am no longer. See, when I got saved, prior to my coming to faith in Christ, I abused drugs, I abused alcohol, I abused people. I was that person. So I don't refer to myself and didn't ever refer to myself as, oh, I'm an alcoholic that is reformed. No, I never did that. I never said that, oh, it's been one year since or two years since or I got my five-year pin or ten-year pin. I never did anything like that. I knew that I had been translated from darkness to light. And I no longer, and as, even as a new believer, I never identified myself as a former drug addict or a or, or no, I should say a recovering drug addict or a recovering alcoholic. No, I was recovered by Christ. I was a covered person. The blood of Christ covered my sin. You have to identify yourself for what you really are. I don't identify with the sin anymore. That's dead. It's buried. It's gone. I have a new life in Jesus Christ. So I am not a former anything. I am brand new in Jesus Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And that's what you identify with. That's how it works. So he says, don't be deceived. When your life changes, you no longer practice a sin as a habit. Romans 6, 14 says, sin shall not be your master because you are not under law. You are under grace. In Christ, I've been set free. You see, verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Salvation and every spiritual gift and blessing originates with God himself. Satan promises good. Your flesh constantly seeks its own satisfaction, but neither Satan nor your flesh can bless you with eternal spiritual blessings. Jesus in John 4, 13 and 14 said, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. The water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. He's speaking to a woman at a well. She's coming to get some water, and he says, you drink that, you're going to get thirsty again. Why? Because natural water only can meet natural needs, and it's something you have to replenish on a daily basis or you'll die. But the, the water that I give you is eternal. You'll never thirst again. So you come to faith in Christ. When I came to faith in Christ, I didn't go out and say, well, now I've got Jesus in my, in my bag of religion. Now let's see what Buddha has to say. Or let's hear what Muhammad has to say. Or let's listen to Krishna for a while, see what he has to say. I didn't do any of that. I didn't need any of that. I had what I needed. I had life in Jesus Christ. That's what I came to Christ for for life, and my thirst was quenched, and that's how it works. And the enemy will say, oh, no, there's Jesus plus. There's never Jesus plus anything. It's just Jesus. All, everything that I have comes from him. Every good gift, every perfect gift comes down from heaven, from the Father of lights, with, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow nor turning. That's what James is teaching us. It comes from God. You have it in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus in John 6, 35 said, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. In John 10, verse 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill, to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. You see, with God, verse 17, there is no variation or shadow of turning. Notice the contrast between God's glory and the sun's brightness. The sun is the source of light, but there are certain things that take place. The sun doesn't shine upon all parts of the earth at the same time. It's nighttime somewhere else. Right now, it's daytime for us. The sun rises and the sun sets. And when, it goes, when, when we go through seasons, there'll be more heat. There'll be less heat. There's a variableness there. There are things that change, but with God... There are no shadows. There are no variations. God's always the same. His character is constant. Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord. I do not change. I could trust him. I can trust him at any given moment because he's always the same. He's good to his word. 
He's our Father. He loves us. He keeps his promises. He corrects us when necessary. He blesses us always. I can trust him. I don't have to wonder where his will is for me today. I don't have to. His word is revealing to me his will. I simply need to know his word and know him. There's no changing in our God. He isn't some kind of person that, that today on some whim or some angry moment is going to change their mind. He doesn't change. And he says in verse 18, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures by his own will. Notice that, of his own will. By his own will, God does things. By his own will, he spoke the universe into existence. In John 1, 3, it says, through him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. It's his word because of his own will, he brought us forth by the word. It is his word, the gospel of his own will that he gave to us. But it's through this word that we are given spiritual life. In 1 Peter 1, 23, you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. And God is the one who originates salvation. And God is the one who gives us the power to do good. And this is in contrast to the evil that is resident within us. And God is good. And God chose to call us. And he did so by presenting to us salvation by what is called the word of the gospel. He offered us life by the message of salvation. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14, we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Instead of living as captives to sin, let this settle in you, please. Instead of living as captives to sin, you have been set free in Jesus Christ. When I was uh, 18 years old, I had broken up with a girlfriend. Actually, she broke up with me, and I was bummed. So I wanted to show her how much I loved her. So I went to a place called Hudson's Jewelers. It just so happened that Hudson's Jewelers was closed at that time I went. So I took a crowbar, and I broke a window, and I stole some rings some diamond rings, because I wanted to give her a gift. I couldn't afford to buy them, so I did five-finger discount, we used to call it. I stole it. And I was on the lam. I ran from the police for about 10 minutes, got caught, and I was put in jail, in the Whittier Jail, in an uptown Whittier. Some of you have been there. <laughs> Probably had the same room I had that night. And the next day... Someone posted my bail. My father did. I, I didn't want to stay another day in that jail. I didn't want to spend another night in that jail. I didn't want to spend another moment in that jail. I didn't want to live in that jail. I didn't want to go to a jail for several years. I didn't want any of that. I wanted out immediately. And I discovered when I got saved that I at one time had been a prisoner of sin, but God opened up that cage, let me out. I never want to go back to that cage again. That's what we have in Jesus Christ. Freedom. Freedom. Why go back to what locked you up? Why go back? You've been set free by Jesus Christ. He gives you the power of the Holy Spirit. He gave you the wisdom of his word. He's given you fellowship and friendships with people who love Jesus also. Why go back to that garbage? Why be the dog that returns to its vomit? Why be the pig that goes back to the mud you've been washed from? Why go back? Live worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ and understand who you are. You are a child of God. You are a child of the King. You belong to Jesus Christ. You are brand new. Don't go back. And he's telling us this. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. These believers are the first fruits. They had the blessing of being amongst the first to hear the gospel and be saved. And they have dignity and they have a ranking among mankind because of salvation. We are his children, and we have a place of honor that comes from him. We are his children, and we have his love, and we have his blessings 
upon us. Do not be deceived. In Christ, you are a new creation. Live for Jesus and watch his blessings pour into your life. And when you go through difficulty, don't be saying, oh, God is hating me right now. Just say, Lord, what are you doing? There's something you're refining in me, and no matter what it is, I'm going to cling to you because there's no place safer than being in your arms. I will stay with you no matter what. If I have to go through hell and high water, I will do so because I'm never alone. You are with me. You never forsake me. You will never leave me. You will take me out, place me in a, put me in a place of abundance because you're my father, and I will trust you no matter what I go through, for you are my father. I am your child, and every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from above from the father of lights with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow nor turning. You are my God. I will stay with you. 